hate crime is a traditional offense that is motivated by bias. For example, hanging a noose or painting a swastika could be deemed as a hate crime. We Jews know this. We know this for centuries. We have been persecuted no matter where we have been. Violent things have been done to us, but right now we need to collectively understand that hate has no place, has no place anywhere. We need to get together. I moved from the city and for 15 years I sat behind Ellie Wiesel in synagogue. And on the high holidays, I used to wash the, the hands of the Kohanim, the, the Jewish priests, uh, with him before they gave us the blessing. And, you know, we never really talked too much because I know where he came from. And, um, you know, we all know that we all came from somewhere that Jews were persecuted. My family came from the east. His family came from the west. But we were there together um, in sharing a cause. And I thought today, uh, as a tribute to him, to the 75th anniversary of the uh, freeing of Auschwitz, um, I'll, during the event, uh, use a few of his quotes, because I think they're very pertinent and uh, always uh, to the point. So I want to start with the first quote, when he said, there may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest. And I think what we are doing today is at least protesting. There's a difference between educating and then acting. There is a, a conversation that uh, Amos Oz, a very famous Israeli writer, when he was always accused of being too pacifist, and he said, you know, uh, I may be um, liberal and I may want to be, uh, I pursue social justice, but I always remember that my, my uh, parents were freed from Auschwitz by tanks. So it means that at a certain point you have to act in order to uh, defend the, the, uh, the one who is persecuted. Some people might be aware of the attack that took place on Yom Kippur in Halle, Germany. So that synagogue had no security guards. They had asked the local German police for protection. German police never arrived. On Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, a neo-Nazi white supremacist showed up with an assault rifle and homemade guns and shot at the door and could not get in. And he actually threw a grenade, a homemade explosive device at the door and still could not get in. And 53 people inside the synagogue were saved. Why? Because the door to the synagogue had been hardened, which is a technical term, using grant money, not from New York State, obviously, but from the Jewish agency, the Sochnut. And that's exactly the same type of program that New York State pays for. I want to tell you at the forefront that the governor is very committed to this issue. He is focused on the rise of anti-Semitism. One of the pieces is funding. So New York State has a leading program providing funding for nonprofits like this synagogue to help protect their own security. So right now there's $45 million available through the New York State Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services in grants to help nonprofits that are at risk of attack institute security measures like cameras, fencing, and hardening. And we know that these measures work. What's more, we're expanding this program. So in the past, the eligibility has only been for certain types of institutions, and the governor announced last week that going forward, he, his proposal for the April budget is that a greater array of institutions, all nonprofits, not just the non-public day schools that were previously eligible, will be eligible for these funds. I want to mention a couple of other things very quickly. The governor is proposing a domestic terrorism law. So he feels that incidents like we saw in Muncie, where a person who was uh, radicalized to hate Jews showed up and tried to attack a house full of worshipers, should be treated like terrorism. It doesn't just need to come across on a plane for it to be terrorism. The governor is proposing as part of the April budget 
that we codify enhanced penalties for these types of attacks. I'll mention two other measures. The governor is increasing funding for the New York State Police Hate Crimes Task Force. I can tell you that one of the things that I do in my role on an almost daily basis is hear about a report of a swastika drawn or uh, an Orthodox Jewish person in Brooklyn harassed or a person with a yarmulke on the subway being harassed. And in these types of instances, working together with the local law enforcement, the, New York, the governor will send in the hate crimes task force of the New York State Police, which has access to statewide information to give greater strength to the investigation. So God forbid swastika on a synagogue, state police, that's, that's a hate crime. Somebody goes up to somebody wearing a yarmulke in the subway and says, you know, something nasty about Israel. There are free speech questions to contend with, but we're going to offer a response, even if it's not necessarily a law enforcement response. And so the governor, this ties into another question, has not been shy about calling out bigoted, divisive comments, even within his own party. And, and I think sort of the bottom line answer is that we're going to respond without necessarily getting lost in the, the theoretical definition contour question. The attacker in Muncie was apprehended in New York City. And we're constantly learning. Two weeks later, the governor returned to Muncie to announce $500,000 for license plate readers and surveillance cameras to constantly innovate against the threats. You know, people are often shocked to find out how small the state police task force actually is. We have 5,000 troopers statewide. For context, there's something like 45,000 members of the NYPD. Um, and so that's part of the motivation for the grant program that I identified. Because at the end of the day, we can't have a trooper outside every synagogue 24-7, nor would we necessarily want to from a strategic perspective. And so I think it is a collective responsibility. I think it's terrific that this event features the state, local, town levels. Um, and that also ties into the role that educators and parents and tech companies have to play. It's obviously a much broader discussion, but I think the, the bottom line is it's a collective responsibility. And, and I'll also mention, for me personally, when we're thinking about what measures should New York State implement to bolster security, we're doing it always in tandem with faith leaders, with security experts. We're not just coming in, oh, you know, we know best and there's one size fits all solution. I'm in touch with whether it's the Union of Reform Judaism or the Orthodox Union or Chabad or camps or whatever it is to find always the right formula for the particular institution. The last piece I'll mention is education. This is really the only way that we can make a difference going upswing. We're talking primarily about preventative measures. But the governor just visited Auschwitz for the 75th anniversary. He was actually the only American elected official to attend the liberation ceremony in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And he came away feeling that it's, it's a shame and it's almost a travesty that more people, that, that, that the memory of Auschwitz is being diminished, that people don't know what Auschwitz was and that six million Jews were killed. And so he wants to mandate in the public schools that students should learn about education, uh, should learn about Auschwitz, and when applicable, for instance, in the case of New York City, should visit the Museum of Jewish Heritage and other sites to learn firsthand about these experiences and about this history. The only refugee shelter during World War II specifically for Jewish refugees from the Holocaust is in New York, where? Oswego. For the people who live in uh, Riverhead, it's not necessarily realistic to travel six hours to visit this specific site. But for the people, for the students within an hour of us we go, that's a natural partner. Things like that. I'd like to thank everyone for the invitation to come and address you guys and your concerns. We maintain an open door policy at the state police. An additional absolute force multiplying factor that plays into our successes here is the relationships between our local partners. The Suffolk County Police, all the East End Police Departments, we operate generally in an almost ad hoc task force fashion on a daily basis. We have mechanisms that exist should a mutual aid need to be called between police agencies in approximately four years out here. That's never had to be instituted because there is a seizure of initiative. We have a highly educated, highly motivated police agency. I'm about to lose my first PhD to promotions, but I have several others with master's degrees multiple with bachelor's degrees. 
These are all very intelligent, bright individuals that you see patrolling your, way, your highways and around your shuls. So that being said, as we move forward, as the threat climate evolves, we will evolve with it. I have 10 years of experience in our counterterrorism branch. I work jointly with the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and I've taken some of the things I've learned from there, most pertinently the structure, more of a decentralized command structure, makes us more flexible, more adaptable, not just internally, but with our external partners as well. And whenever the time for questions comes, I'll be happy to address general strategic initiatives. I would rather not in a public forum address tactical initiatives as they may compromise safety or ongoing operations. Good afternoon. My name is Vincent Ogier with the New York State Police Counterterrorism Unit. Thank you, thank you for having me today. A uh, big part of what my unit does is uh, try to get the community to report suspicious behavior, suspicious people. So how many people here have heard of see something, say something? Almost everyone. So to enhance that initiative, the New York State Police came up with a, a mobile application for your smartphone to increase that reporting. So if you go to your app store on your iPhone or your Android uh, and type see something, send something, you can download an application which gives you the ability to send suspicious reporting directly to the New York State Intelligence Center. What that does, that helps us interdict these people before they want to ca carry out their cowardly attacks. So you take a picture, you can send a note, you send that to the New York State Police, and in turn that will be analyzed by an investigator and then turned over to the, prop, uh, the appropriate police agency for further investigation. Clearly, uh, this is a moment when we have an obligation to step up and look at anti-Semitism and, and, and take the responsibility for lowering the temperature, but also t holding people accountable for what they do. Um, too often, people can um, create some type of uh, hostile environment, uh, initiate some type of anti-bias or some bias type incident, or commit a hate crime. And we have a tendency, if there's some horrific thing that didn't happen by society standards, to ignore it or to just pass it over, or they didn't mean it, or it's just a kid, or it's, it, it, it's not that no one got hurt. But we know that words matter. We know that where there's, where there's hate, ultimately there could be violence. We know that when people are allowed to step forward and do and say horrible things, ultimately horrible things occur. And so we need to take the initiative and the responsibility and hold ourselves accountable, those of us in government, those of us who have uh, authority to act, uh, to take those measures, invest those resources, formulate these partnerships, find the, the talent and create the programs so that we uh, can respond. And it is a partnership and we need our communities, we need our individuals to, to step forward and let us know. So often, uh, people who experience some type of biased incident are silent. Um, there was a swastika on someone's sidewalk. They don't want to make a, a, a scene. They don't want to create this. It's embarrassing. So they say nothing. Or someone says something to your child. It's bullying. It's, oh, it's typical. It's just kids. It's just in school. But we have to know that that's not enough. We can't just say it's, it's okay. It's just that. We have to at least report it. Let's document it. Let's have the conversation. Let's speak to parents. Let's speak to the individual themselves. Show them and their community and those that are involved, that it really matters. And so in Suffolk County, uh, we're doing a number of things, uh, and, and uh, we'll speak about it, the law enforcement folks certainly, we're, we're, we're working um, to how to harden uh, synagogues, how do we find ways to, to do an assessment of, of, of a shul like this and, and, and make us safer. One of the things that we've done in, in Suffolk County is uh, we've supported uh, something called the RAVE application. It's a RAVE app, it's, and we, we started with in schools. All right, we're all concerned about, about this, the school shootings. It's, it's horrific, and it's all over the country. And what if, in one of our schools, what do we do? Do we arm guards? Do we hire? Does everyone have a gun? Do the teachers have guns? Do all the kids have guns? Does everyone just shoot each other? I mean, what do we do when we have one of these incidents? And inevitably, they say, sometimes something will happen. What do we do? And so what we're trying to do is one, make sure that our police in Suffolk County are partnering with the, uh, the police in, 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 in the towns and, and, and some of the villages. And we're creating a skill set that allows us uh, to come in and have knowledge of how to deal with a school shooting. And it's incredible what they do. And there's these school shooter programs where you can go and watch and you learn what happened in the past, how, do they, how they can isolate somebody, how many seconds they have to actually do it. We, we had a stop the bleed uh, program at Suffolk County. We're all employees. 
and where we brought this to all the school superintendents and how to stop the bleeding. Most people who die, who get shot, die of bleeding to death within a matter of minutes. So you have to literally take the time to learn how to deal with a person who's bleeding. That's something we should do in our synagogues and churches, but we should do that in our synagogues. And it's hard to do, but it's something we should do. We should take that time. We need to understand how to help ourselves if something horrible happens. But we use technology also. The new technology allows us to put, uh, uh, have a central system where our police headquarters can actually see on CCTVs, the TVs that every school now is putting in, and have this rave button. Someone presses the button. And that person is now becomes a homing device on them. And all of a sudden, if there's a shooter in the, in the, in the, in the room next door, they can, they can lock the doors. And they can flicker the lights, and they can speak to people, and they can give people direction. Don't run in that direction. That's, if you're going in the, the wrong way. To try to minimize the damage. Well, we are making that available to, to synagogues as well. Um, and so there's, we have this app, and it's cost, it, it, the, the county made uh, an incredible investment in, in it. It's, um, it's something that we're sharing with all 69 school districts of Suffolk County. Uh, and again, we're working with the town of Southampton and, and, and East Hampton and others. And so using technology and developing skills and training uh, to not just now focus on schools, but also our places of worship and other places, such as, as you know, large places where people congregate, uh, it's a way for us to keep ourselves safer. But then what else can we do? Um, one of the things we've launched into is that we're creating a, an island-wide task force. Uh, an anti-hate task force. And the challenge for an anti-hate task force, when you're looking at issues of anti-Semitism, which inspire the anti-hate task force, is not to get lost in just hate in general, right? I mean, we appreciate that nobody should be hurt for what they look like or what they believe in or, or where they come from. But if there's anti-Semitic incidents, let's focus, even as an anti-hate task force, on the anti-Semitic incidents. Don't diminish the victimization of someone who's Jewish or the perception or, or, or hate that goes on to this one community by having us share it with everyone. On the other hand, let's not lose sight of the humanity that every other individual has and, and, and respect they deserve, the dignity of each individual. And it's a real challenge. And so as we pull together this, 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 this task force, uh, we are making sure that we focus on hate in general, but on anti-Semitism in particular. And we need to figure out a way to give people an opportunity to report it, even if it's not a crime. And the question was, what if it's, you know, how do you define anti-Semitism? Another question would be, how do you define a hate crime? If it's not a hate crime, should I report it? If it's just an incident, if it's, just, if it's someone calling someone a name? And the answer is yes. We need to report every anti-bias or every bias incident that exists. And we need to record it and document it. We need to look for patterns. We need to hold people accountable and responsible. And so we are going to, through this task force, figure out a way in both Suffolk County and Nassau County, because people cross borders, they go all over the state. And by the way, we have a great partner in the state, the governor and, and, and the state police as well, uh, not just with our, our county police and our, and our town police, uh, but the state police, incredible resource for us. And so between our task force and our, and, and, and our, and our law enforcement uh, and the county executive, Steve Ballone's commitment to make sure that this is a priority for us, uh, I hope that we are going to make a difference, and we're going to make a difference together, and we're going to have affect change because we need to address it where it starts, and that's when somebody uh, starts with that anti-bias incident, it develops into a hate crime. Let's prevent it before it gets worse. And so thank you for giving me, and on behalf of Steve alone, the opportunity to speak to you here today. Thank you, Lee Don. Before we get to the next representative, I just want to actually interject with the question that uh, just, so you're saying that we can have cameras uh, in the synagogues from the uh, county? Uh, well, so what the schools are doing, the schools all have their own, they're, they're purchasing their own camera systems. And we have, there's, there's several companies that we've contracted with. There's privacy issues with these cameras that you would have as well. I mean, what do you want, you don't want, every room in your, in, in, in your, in your building to have the police monitoring on a regular basis. Um, there's certain, and so the way we're trying to work it out is if you were to install a CCTV, some type of camera system here, um, there's grants for that, and that might be something to work with the state on, or locally as well. Uh, but then if we, have like the, if we have the Rave app, you press the button, and then the, sent the headquarters, police headquarters would then turn on that camera, or at least have access to the camera. In other words, you might have access to it all the time, but there are legitimate privacy issues. People should be able to come to Shul and pray and, 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 you know, to, with, amongst yourselves without having the state watch it. On the other hand, we, we're fearful and we want to know that the police know what's going on, and especially if something horrible is happening. So it's a, it's a process. But yes, there are means to get those kind of resources here. Just so you know, the Suffolk County Police Department, everybody, all the police officers in Suffolk County do attend the police academy that we run. They do spend a whole week um, discussing um, 
hate crimes and things of that nature, but they also spent a whole day in Glen Cove at the Holocaust uh, Memorial and Tolerance Center. One of the fe we've been doing that for over a decade now, and the feedback we get from the center is the Suffolk County Police Department recruits, and that includes the recruits from Riverhead, the recruits from uh, South Hold, Southampton. They're all excellent. They're the best students they ever have in that center for that one day, and they really enjoy doing that with us. Uh, that's something we're going to keep and continue to do. Um, to speak on the cameras, the cameras actually fall underneath uh, the real-time crime center, which um, if anybody is interested in connecting those cameras, they would be your cameras, just so you know, that would be whatever you have here and whatever we can import to us. And there would be some type of memorandum of agreement put into place that would allow us under certain circumstances, the rave app going off, um, a call, a 911 call that might, you know, uh, trigger that depending on the nature of the 911 call. It would allow us to turn those cameras on in the real-time crime center. It's not something that we can hit a switch now and have your cameras into the real-time crime center tomorrow, but it's something that we can work towards. So we all do keep in touch and we do know what's going on out there. I call myself the boots on the ground person. What do individual synagogues or any house of worship do if there's an emergency? That's where I come in. I do a safety in the sanctuary presentation. I explain to you the uh, response groups you should put in place in your synagogues what you should do and shouldn't do. I also do, as part of that, active shooter presentation, so you know what to do, and also an evacuation. So if you had an evacuation drill in your synagogue, that means I was there. We want to teach everybody what they need to do to stay safe. I also come in and do assessments on maybe where you could harden a target or where do you want to create a safe area within your synagogue. God forbid there is an incident and somebody is handicapped and can't get out and they can't run. What do we do with those people? How do we keep those people safe? At the individual bottom level when you need to put together a plan, that's how we prevent things from happening. Having a comprehensive plan, I help you write the plan. The government also gives you a, a template to use, but they write it in governmentese, and I will help you put that in English, and we can have a nice comprehensive plan on what we do in all of these situations. Bomb threats, active shooter, power outage. We like to go all comprehensive and all hazard. I think we hear a lot of the words out there, what is a hate crime? I invite everyone, if they're bored, to uh, open the New York State Penal Law and read 4505. It's very specific what a hate crime is. My famous line I like saying to people when they think they're a victim of a hate crime is, you may or may not be, I'll look at it. Our office will investigate it. I don't make the laws, I just follow them. I wish I could write some laws. I would probably change a little things here and there. Somebody brought up before a really interesting thing that I like telling people. You should document every situation. If you have somebody who is a victim of, someone is wearing a yarmulke and someone is making fun of them, Calling them names. Is that a crime? Probably not. There's a freedom of speech I think Mr. Snow brought up as before. You should document that. We should look at that. And someone else brought it. Is there a pattern or a systemic issue going on? Just recently, I was involved in the police department in a mapping issue, uh, I'm sorry, a mapping program that went on within the police department. I am the map maker for all hate crimes and hate instances in Suffolk County. We watch them. Somebody will ask us why. We watch them because we want to see, is there a pattern going on? Did we miss something? Is there something? The police department is dedicated to this issue. Those maps are set out to all high-level ranking commanding officers. They look at it and they could say, hey, Sandy, they'll call me up. What's going on in this area? I see a lot of red dots. And I could say, hey, inspector, we looked at that. We're aware of it. There was uh, an issue going on where I don't know, somebody put up five, uh, five posters or something. You know, even something like that, leafleting, posters, stickers, we monitor that stuff. As I was saying before, the term is thrown out there very loosely and we see a lot of things. What you see is one thing, what we can physically charge somebody is another. And it's, I hate to say the word, it's not as easy as you think. It's, it's one of those tougher laws where if you read the law, we have to almost get in, if you read the first section that says intentionally selects and or targets an individual based on the 10 protected classes, we almost have to get in the mind of the bad guy and say, what were your intentions? Was your intent to target that person and what was your motivational factor? Very, very difficult. We uh, will open the floor for uh, a few minutes for uh, questions.
Good. Uh, I'll expand a little bit Menachem's uh, question. Um, we in Brooklyn, where he uh, lives uh, most of the time, he has there's a police car in front of every shul basically for synagogue. Uh, the hour of Friday night service and two hours on Shabbat morning. Uh, the question is, do we have the local resources to have it in front of uh, synagogues for the same three hours? Um, I don't want to speak for the East End agencies, but I can tell you the Suffolk County Police Department, we do not have those resources. Um, you know, we do patrol checks. Uh, we'll pass there several times throughout that hour, those three hours, however long it might be. Get in touch with the commanding officer wherever the uh, synagogue is located. And the presentation, like Officer Lamore does, you know, that's going to help you target hardening, um, and maybe look for certain things to, you know, give us that call. Give us that call right away to see something, say something. So if something's unusual, or maybe it'll train your ushers to notice someone who doesn't belong in there or somebody who's even in the parking lot and give us a call right away. But to have someone sit outside, no, we don't have those resources. Sorry. Okay, let me just say um, both Nassau and Suffolk counties both have a policy now where they send police during times where temples are uh, in use with, with high occupancy to stop by, to, to have a presence, uh, now to get out of the car and even walk around. And that's actually changed. It used to be just to drive by. But now the, the notion of getting out of the car and walking around a little bit. Years ago, if you saw a police officer walk outside and walk into your show, you'd, you'd be a little startled. Uh, but now it's actually, it's welcome. And people like to see it to comfort level, just to see the car parked out there, not for three hours, but for 20 minutes, have someone walk around. You don't know when they're going to come. And that's part of the, the plan, is that no one knows when they're going to come. But there is more of a presence than, in both counties than there was. Yes. The gentleman is saying that in New York City they pay extra hours for police officers that want to um, work more. So they could be applied in these cases staying in front of a, uh, the synagogue during the service time. Um, okay? Do you want to so, comment? Yeah, I mean, I could just say that there's, you know, we've actually, we've looked into what New York City does. You know, I'm one of the people that helps negotiate the police contracts for, for Suffolk County. I've actually negotiated Nassau's contract as well. Um, when I was there. Um, and so that's a contractual issue uh, that we have to, to work into the contract, how much they'll make, what are they, do they wear the uniform, do they not wear the uniform, do they get training from us? You know, the cost is significant from, from a Suffolk County standpoint. Um, you know, we spend upwards of a billion dollars a year on police and taxes are what they are. Uh, they would go up significantly if we augment uh, our force or if we ask people to pay for it, then the cost would be significant. It's not, it's not an inexpensive uh, process for you to, hire, to, to pay a, a, a Nassau or Suffolk County police officer at their rates. Uh, on the other hand, to hire a private security who's not wearing a uniform creates different issues. Um, if a policeman comes in and they see a person fumbling around with a gun, that's probably the first person they're going to shoot. And when they do their training exercises, the security guard's usually the first person that gets it. So it's a, it's a, the ideal situation is to have professional law enforcement people in the mix because they're getting the training, they're aware of the, 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 the weaponry, they're, they're communicating with uh, people, but the, the, with, the, with the law enforcement agencies, but with the costs and it's, it's something that we're in a good, the schools are asking for this by the way, so it's a really big issue with the schools. Uh, but just with every place of worship, you could just imagine how, how large a force we'd we'll be talking about. Um, and I know uh, Mr. Kamen had mentioned uh, armed security at temples. If you do do that, please you know, notify whether it's the local police agency, the Suffolk County, you know, wherever you are, notify the police department. We can put alerts in our system and address an alert so we know when the police officers, you know, when they're responding to your, uh, your, wherever that might be, whether it's your place of business, your temple, your school, that we're going to encounter armed security. Um, you know, so please definitely let us know. Thank you. I, um, I have uh, one question. Um, if um, we have congregants who have a... Uh, you know, gun permit, um, how would, should we uh, treat that? You know, if you have a congregate who has, you know, if I'm in, you know, uh, I'm a Roman Catholic, if I'm in church, and, you know, because of the active shooter training that I've done, the first thing I do is I look at all the exits, hey, we're going to sit over here because this is how we're going to get out. My wife and my two sons are getting out before I start taking any police action. I'm not going to lie to you. You know, that's what's going to happen. Your congregates are going to take care of their family first. That's who I went to church with, and that's who's leaving alive today. I'll get them out of the church, and then I'm going to come back in, and then I'll engage. But uh, I would not count on people who are there with their family to, uh, you know, get into a gun battle for you. Come back in later on, definitely. Um, but uh, if they have people who you want to 
maybe work it out so they're volunteers, maybe they're your ushers, they come to a service with their family at this hour, and when their family's not there, they're now your ushers, that's something I would recommend. Right, and just to, to build upon that, you know, and I've had several conversations with, with our police commissioner, uh, Jerry Hart, our new police commissioner now for about a year, and, and, and our uh, uh, police who would work, work on these, um, these issues. There really is a concern if somebody, on the one hand, you feel safer because somebody in your congregation has a weapon and maybe they can save the day, and sometimes that works. Uh, but it doesn't always work out that way, and, and it's a false sense of security. We, we, what we really want to do is build systems, make sure that people are trained properly, that you have an understanding of how to best protect yourself individually, your family, and your larger congregation, and this goes for any place of worship, uh, that you possibly use technology, that you maybe acquire uh, better training, but you acquire the equipment, such as the TVs. Um, give yourself the best chance. Uh, understand how to report something. Uh, the 10, 15, 20 seconds that you save by having an app or the 60 or 90 seconds that you say by having an app could be the difference between you know, mayhem and, and some uh, other incident. But the, it really is, it's dangerous to try to think that you're gonna have some person who's supposed to be that hero. They might not be there that day. They might not be equipped. They might be having a bad day. They might shoot the wrong person. They, you know, it's, on the other hand, they might, you know, somebody, uh, if a cop, retired cop or an off-duty cop who has a gun, Pat Ryder from Nassau County says he goes into his church. He knows there's three retired detectives in there. He feels pretty comfortable. Uh, not necessarily every place is going to have that place. Um, you got to be careful about that as a solution. In the security and the law enforcement industry, we hearten targets such as the door of the synagogue through layering. So for an example, you'll have cameras, you'll have signage outside, you'll have uh, alarms, you may have security, you may have dogs. Those are all layers. And as you build these layers, you hearten that target. So for example, this, this um, synagogue may become, become uh, may be a soft target. And so you're go talking about security, you're having a, a forum like this, you're having communication, you're opening up communication. Here in Riverhead, we have another layer. We have the anti-bias task force. That is definitely a layer. It consists of members of the community and it's an important integral part of our government. As a former supervisor of the New York City Police Department, we will always support the efforts of securing our houses of worship. I just want to make a note that FEMA offers a course. It's, it's, a number, it's labeled IS907. It's free to anyone. It's an online course. It's uh, an active shooter course. You get a certification and you get credits for the course. So if you want to go online, type in FEMA IS907. It's a very interactive course. They ask you 10 questions afterwards, and uh, you get your certification, and now you become more informed as to what to do. It's critical that you understand when these incidents occur and happen that you know what action to take. Combating the individual who's responsible for the act is not the way to go, unless you are trained and you're an enforcement um, officer. And you, always, it, it, you can also um, you know, review the course if you don't want to take it. They do have a pamphlet where you, you can read and become more informed. And with that, I'm going to have my chief talk about uh, our crime stats and where we are. And uh, again, thank you for this forum, council. This is where you start. You started the conversation and keep it going. Good afternoon and thank you for having me. My name is Dave Hegemiller. I'm your chief of police, your local chief of police. I've been a police officer in the town for 38 years. I can remember prov providing patrols on holy days to the temple 38 years ago. So we've been doing it for 30 years. We have a great relationship with the temple. If they need something, they give me a call. Well, Linda's giving me a call and we provide extra patrols when we can. Uh, we know your schedules, so they're always out there patrolling. You live close to headquarters, so you're going to see a lot of police cars around here anyway. Um, just to uh, touch base uh, on relationships and what the former supervisor said, we're the local police department, so the buck stops here. So you call me if you have a problem. And then I reach out to my partners, my county partners, my state partners. We'll have a great working relationship, and we all get the job done. So um, if there is a problem, make sure you give my office a call, and we'll come down and we'll take care of it. 
As far as stats, did I go over those? Uh, I've looked last uh, five years since 2015. There's no reported hate crimes against the temple since then. And I can't really remember of any before then, actually. So I think we're in pretty good shape. On the reporting issue, um, I'm sure on the UCR it must be captured, the hate crime. So that's going to the state and to, then to the feds. That's only going to get better in the, in the near future because we're going to go to NIBRS compliant. So and everyone will be on the same page. We're also going to go to a shared records management system with the county. South Old, Southampton will all be on the same records management system. So things are only going to get better. Well, I'm happy to be here and be part of this. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I guess it's, it's a little sad that we would have to have a forum like this. Right? But uh, as Jews, we know that the unthinkable happens and anti-Semitism has been rising. Perhaps, uh, you know, what happened in Pittsburgh just over a year ago at the Tree of Life Synagogue was a, you know, a horrible wake-up call. Uh, but anti-Semitism has been rising since. And it's interesting, like, as I walk into a synagogue like this, it, the fact that I, we have to think about safety and security and are we safe here and what steps and what precautions are being taken. Um, as I sat down, and I hadn't um, prepared remarks for today, I've been scribbling notes, but when I first sat down, one of the congregants here came up to me and said, you know, many years ago, uh, when I was a student teacher, I met your father. I, I, I was a student teacher with your father. And, uh, and it reminded me, you know, he was a great man who uh, fought in World War II and in the Korean conflict. But what um, a lot of people probably didn't know who knew my father is he also uh, worked for uh, B'nai B'rith, the Anti-Defamation League, part of B'nai B'rith, and uh, had told me a story um, about when he was down south, how they burned a cross into his lawn made me very aware that we were Jewish and people do terrible things sometimes. Of course, my mother's side was, was far worse. My mother was an immigrant from Hungary. Uh, she uh, was fortunate enough in a weird way, ironically, to have been orphaned uh, at the age of 14 uh, and sent to America right before the rise of Hitler. Um, so her side of the family that remained in Hungary were completely obliterated in the concentration camp. So, uh, you know, I'm quite aware of anti-Semitism and the horrors, um, and, and it's frightening to see, uh, see it on the rise. You know, I wondered when I first entered elected office whether a Jewish person could be elected on the east end of Long Island. And I'm happy to say, you know, I've been elected, I guess, 10 times now. But, uh, you know, in Southampton, we have a Jewish mayor a Jewish supervisor, a Jewish congressman. In fact, a representative of uh, Congressman Zeldin is here. Um, so maybe times have changed. Maybe the public is a little bit more accepting. But, uh, you know, there's still those concerns. I put together a quick list of some of the th ways that I think that, um, that government can help. And when I think about Southampton, itself, we probably, we have lots of places of worship from Chabad houses to synagogues. Um, we also have some of the wealthiest Jews in the world that are living there, maybe not year round, part time. Uh, you know, Michael Bloomberg, George Soros, lots of, lots of people that we need to protect as well because who knows, you know, who might be a target. So uh, I think the first step is is to acknowledge that anti-Semitism exists. And I think forums like this are helpful in that regard. Um, more public education, people need to recognize what anti-Semitism is. Um, we need to assess the risk. I mentioned places of worship but, um, and homes of certain people who may you know, be celebrities. But um, we, we need to take the steps to identify those risks and figure out how to prevent possible attacks. And that means cooperation between law enforcement and members of the Jewish community um, who understand what the vulnerabilities are very well. Uh, we need to take the steps to actually improve protection. That may be video cameras. It may be hardening areas. Um, it may be increased uh, police patrols. It may be, as Mr. Kamen said, you know, providing funding for, for certain things, or I think the governor's representative uh, mentioned financing some of these things. 
Um, we need to plan together what to do if there is a crisis, if there is an incident, how to manage that crisis. That means, again, working with law enforcement and the Jewish community. We need to recognize anti-Semitism, whether it's in social media, somebody's statement, um, an advertisement. During my last campaign, people kept coming up to me because there was an ad against me in the newspaper that it was a cartoon caricature and it exaggerated you know, my nose, it had me hunched over, big eyebrows, and people kept coming over to me and saying, that's anti-Semitic. I can't believe the newspaper would run that ad. That's like classic, you know, if it was an African-American and they accentuated, you know, lips or whatever it might be. And so I, and I called the newspaper, I said, look, six or seven people came up to me and said, your ad that you're running is anti-Semitic. And I'm not saying you should pull the ad, but you should at least have an internal conversation about whether this is the right thing, the right message for the newspaper. They ended up running the ad. They didn't pull it down, but at least I got them talking about it. So, you know, maybe one day that will change. Um, I think another thing we need to do is we have to be really clear in our messaging. When there is anti-Semitism, we have to come out and condemn it with the clearest message together as a community, standing together, no wishy-washy response. It, you know, we have to send a message that discrimination of any kind is an attack on society itself. Attack on all of us. Any sort of hate crime, any sort of message that has a, you know, has strong bias has to be by all community leaders, elected officials, probably more than any, have to come out and really state very clearly that that is unacceptable, it will not be tolerated in the community, um, and that we will do everything to protect people and to prevent hate. So with that, um, I want to turn things over to my, uh, one of my lieutenants at Southampton Police Department. We're very active on this issue. I mentioned some of the vulnerabilities. Uh, Detective Lieutenant Kiernan is going to speak a little bit about some of the things Southampton Town is doing to prevent violence against Jewish people and really all forms of hate attacks. Before I say a few things about what Southampton Town Police is doing uh, in this area, I want to say, um, because it's been brought up a couple of times, our partners in, in the county and the state, um, we train with them continually. So no matter what level you go to for your training, Suffolk in, in particular has made a point to make sure we're all teaching the same thing. Um, and, and that's really important. So you're not going to get a different show from each agency. You're going to get qualified training from anywhere you go. Um, the state police also train all my counterterrorism people in, um, in suspicious behavior investigations. So, so what, what I'm trying to say is the partnership that, that, uh, that, that exists between uh, local, state, and county levels is, uh, is very strong, and you will get a tremendous service from any level that you, uh, you choose to use, because um, we all have our, our roles. Let me tell you what we're doing in Southampton to prevent these type of things. First, we've adopted a model. We, there's nobody better in the world at counterterrorism than Israel. Um, New York City is a second, far distant second to Israel in counterterrorism, um, but they are very good and we train with New York City all the time because they're here. So we get a lot of training from New York City, but in Southampton we have adopted the Israeli model to counterterrorism. We've adopted the Israeli model. Their model is every Israeli every day. I don't know if you've heard that, maybe some of you have. Every Israeli, every day, that means there's a partnership. Partnership, it's not the government, it's, it's not the police, it's not the military, it's everybody in the community, and it's everybody's responsibility to, to protect the, our communities. And that's the, that's the model that we use in, in, uh, in Southampton Town. How we do that? We have a new chief of police. This chief of police is uh, Stephen Skrinecki. He has a seat on the Law Enforcement Advisory Board at the ADL. We have a very close relationship with the ADL. Um, I go to regular meetings on Third Avenue in Manhattan, law enforcement meetings that they conduct, um, and I use their researchers 
where our, our resources are limited, the ADL has, research, has, has um, researchers that I can use. If I have somebody that I want them to monitor on social media, for instance, they'll do a whole workup for me and get it back to me uh, where I wouldn't be able to, to have those uh, dedicated detectives for that. Um, so how, how do we get this done? We have a counterterrorism unit and a criminal intel unit. That's, that's one and the same. That's, that's the division that I had. We, and we have a community outreach program. And that's Lieutenant Ralph who does that for us. In the, in the community uh, outreach program, we do the things that we've all been talking about. I, don't, I won't repeat them for you, but we do houses, uh, houses of worship training, target hardening. Um, one in particular, and, and that community outreach program schedules our, our counterterrorism unit to go out and do these things. Um, we worked with the Green, uh, Greek Orthodox Church last year, and uh, we talked about security here and, and things that are going in the right direction. What we, um, what we talked about it in the Greek Orthodox Church was, it's, uh, because they don't have security, they don't have armed security, um, we talked about 10 people that would volunteer for specific training. When, you, when I go to church, you, I, don't, I don't enjoy the spiritual part of the, of the service because I'm constantly vigilant and I'm constantly looking around. How am I going to get people out of here if the person comes from there, comes from there? So I haven't been able to enjoy that type of, that type of life for a long time, but that's my job. That's my job, but you shouldn't have to do that. So if you have like 10 volunteers that go through this training and they only have to do one Friday night or one Saturday in 10, that person is the person that has to be vigilant that day. That person has to watch the doors, has to watch the back, has to call the police if anything is suspicious. Everybody else then can enjoy the service and, and have a... Uh, and have a nice worship day. So that's one of the things that they, they did and uh, we helped them with. We helped them manage that and we helped them do the training for that. Um, another thing that's important is our local police have local intimate knowledge of the communities that we serve. Um, I know of one person in particular. I have a drawer full of people that have made school threats. Those people I monitor. I look at their social media, I see what's going on with them every day. I know one person in my community who's anti-Semitic and, and delivers leaflets from time to time. Um, and I know him personally, he knows me. Um, I, I talk to him on a regular basis. I even last year, 18 months ago, got a call in my office from the, uh, who, somebody from North Carolina who, claimed to be the Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, who told me that if I did not stop harassing Douglas Munker, the entire legal team of the Ku Klux Klan was gonna come down on me. I can tell you that police officers often get sued, and that was a day I was proud of. I enjoyed hearing that the Ku Klux Klan was not happy with what I was doing. So with that, these are, these are some of the things that we do. Um, there's so much that I could talk about. I talk about counterterrorism to anybody who will listen. We have a Citizens Police Academy that I really wish all of you will go through at some point because it, it is a fantastic program. It's a, it's a little bit of a commitment, but I, I do counterterrorism um, blocks in that, in that uh, forum, and we welcome you to come anytime. We don't, terrorism doesn't have borders, so we will come to Riverhead. We will come as long as, as long as Riverhead will, will have us and as long as, you know, we're all partners in this. So, um, so the town of Southold, which is representing uh, most of the North Fork, um, I'm responsible for two houses of worship for the Jewish community. The uh, congregation Tefereth Israel, uh, represented by Rabbi Capella, and the North Fork Reform Synagogue in Kutchog. So my strategy really with both of our places of worship is just to maintain a open line of communication. Um, and I'm sure the rabbi can verify this. Um, we speak on a regular basis. Uh, we meet on a regular basis um, at both locations. You know, we have um, done walkthroughs, security assessments at both locations and um, been able to um, you know, make some suggestions of new camera systems, how to harden their facility a little bit, um, how to deal with um, 
if you did have an active shooter in the building, how to get them um, out of the um, sanctuary themselves or if they're in the meeting room, um, places of ingress, egress, um, you know, just trying to work out the logistics of, of how you'd clear a building if you had to. Um, we also uh, will be doing for all of our houses of worship on the North Fork, including both of the synagogues, a, um, a security briefing or a um, presentation, and we're going to be asking Vinny from Suffolk County PD to help us out with, uh, with that. Um, he's hit a couple of, uh, his department's hit a couple of the local houses of worship on the North Fork. Um, trying to make it easy for you by bringing everybody together in one spot, and we're going to try to try to uh, address all the houses of worship on the North Fork. So, um, so that's being planned right now. Um, we're hoping sometime for the month of uh, March or April. Uh, we also, um, I also sit on the anti-bias task force in our town, which um, any kind of topics um, similar to this also arise and are addressed. Um, so, just those are really my main um, my main focuses of um, of this topic, and it's um, I enjoy the relationship that we have, and um, and I think as far as there was a question before about um, having a police car in Greenport, which is under our jurisdiction, um, that is really more a power. Uh, a, a problem of um, deploying manpower in the town and how much staffing that you have on. Um, I would love to be able to have a, uh, a marked police unit outside um, both of the synagogues whenever needed. Uh, we do on the holy days and um, recently for the Holocaust uh, memorial service um, did have officers assigned there. So if it is a specific um, incident, we always try to have um, a car assigned there, but they're always included in our extra patrols um, on a regular basis through the town. I do have to say, as a uh, as when I was dealing with uh, Chief Flatley um, about a few incidents that we um, had, not necessarily anti-Semitic, but um, I really have to say that they've been handling the community matters very in a very sensitive way um, and respectful way. So I have, I have confidence in the in the local police. So okay, uh, questions. Yes. Do you have extra police cars that you can just literally park there? <laughs> Not a bad idea. A blow up, a blow up cop. Okay, good. Your, your idea is a really good idea. It would, be, but it, there would, there were, there were, there would be problems with the security to the equipment. But what would work probably is a, a uh, periodic. Police car. If once it, once it's there all the time, no, no, no. then they get used to it. Nobody's in there. They knock on the door. They they, they get so once in a while on on the days that that there's more people here, the the few days before that or the, you know on those particular days, absolutely and extra patrols. We do you know we get requests for extra patrols all the time, and no doubt that you will get them. You will get extra patrols whenever you request them. And that just means what happens is something comes out of my office counterterrorism. We, we ask our crew units, our community response units, to pay particular attention to a certain area. Um, but, but any request for extra patrols, you, have, you will get extra patrols. Let me start off by saying um, hate is hate. I don't care how you color it. I don't care what you do with it. It's hate. You call it anti-Semitism. That's hate. Any form of hate is hate. This congressman and you were talking about it earlier, about calling out anti-Semitism for what it is. He's been very vocal, very visible on the floor of the House. He's been calling out members, and you know what I'm talking about when I'm saying that. The problem is getting leadership to follow up and carry that through and call hate what it is. It's hate. I don't care who does it, it's still hate. You need to make those members accountable. That's what we need to keep to do is put the pressure on those that are in leadership to actually make them accountable for being anti-Semitic or whatever it is they do to be called, using the word hate. We're very proud of this congressman. He was one of the ones in the delegation that was there when we moved our U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. That was a big day. We were very happy to do that. This is what he does for the Jewish community. By the way, as Jay mentioned, he's Jewish. Um, so he knows, he knows exactly what it means, what it, what it feels like to be Jewish, what it feels like to have anti-Semitism, and that type of hate thrown towards him and his family, and sometimes towards his staff. But again, that's what we do. We represent you. But we deal with Suffolk County, we deal with state, we deal with our federal partners. 
and maintaining a vigilance in the first CD, and also because of the way things are today, maintaining security for the congressman. And if it wasn't for these folks here doing their job, and I can't say thank you enough on behalf of our, our staff and the congressman for what you do, we appreciate it, what you do. A couple of things, I just wanna talk a little bit about we supported $90 million in funding for the nonprofit security grant program in Congress over the last several years. Introduced the bipartisan resolution to commemorate 75 years since the liberation of Auschwitz. That was huge, it was a huge day. Um, he was just there in the White House with the president when the proposal came up to go ahead and there was a peace plan presented for Israel and Palestine. So he was there when that was done. We're hopeful. We're hopeful that there will be peace. He introduced H Resolution 782, which is a resolution which has encouraged public schools throughout the country to design and teach a curriculum on the history of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust and the historic importance of the creation of the Jewish state of Israel in 1948. That's huge. People aren't talking about that. People are forgetting. They would like to see things forgotten and to move on. Well, we can't. We know we can't do that. My father was a World War II veteran, D-Day plus two. Korean War and Vietnam, he never forgot. People don't forget, you can't forget. You know you just need to continue to teach the generations so that they know and they never forget. And we don't continue to make these mistakes, but we continue to call them out as hate. Which brings me to, to the Never Again Education Act. Again, education, expanding Holocaust education, ensuring that this dark time in history never repeats itself authorized $10 million over five years to go to these activities. Expands the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's education program. It's, again, it's about education, 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 keeping people thinking about what's right and what's wrong and how to actually address this situation, never walk away from it. Anti-Semitism Awareness Act. This legislation is designed to help the Department of Education, Department of Justice, effectively determine whether an investigation of an incident of anti-Semitism is warranted under the Anti-Discrimination Enforcement Authority. He co-sponsored this. Special Envoy to Monitor Combat Anti-Semitism Act of 2019. Again, special, setting up a special envoy for doing this as an ambassador rank official to lead the office to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. Because anti-Semitism raises its ugly head everywhere. It doesn't know borders. be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.